grateful for that as well. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. John chapter number 14. I'm grateful for the fellows that went with us to the men's rally on Friday night at Campbell. We had 10 men that went, and there was others with different obligations that were would have went. But we did have a very nice time, time of fellowship afterwards. And uh, we all went eight together, and it uh, it's growth, it's strength when you come together. Amen? It is strength, and I enjoy it. John 14 and 13. And whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. And give me verse 14 as well. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. It's quite possible that these are two of the most misunderstood scriptures in the Bible. In fact, they are ministering and speaking in the same vein as the book of Psalms chapter number 37 tells us to delight thyself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. He gives us the right desires. He places the right desire in us. He gives us the right things to want for. And then when our will and his will are in alignment, we aren't asking amiss as it were, but we are asking in accord with his will. So many people think that this passage of scripture is saying, whatever you ask the Lord for, he's going to give it to you. Period. It doesn't mean that. First off, he says, whatever you ask in my name, I will do it. And we have to also understand that you cannot live a life oblivious to God. You can't live a life delighting yourself in the things of the world and the things of the flesh and then just call him up on any given day and tell him what you want and he's required to give it. There is some responsibility in living for God that rests upon our shoulders. We have to be committed to Him. We have to be aware of what He wants. We have to strive and press and push, as Paul said to Lord the prize of the mark of the high calling. The world has allowed lackadaisical, easy come, easy go religion to permeate their thinking in their relationship with God. But I'm telling you, I've been blessed, and the Bible says, to whom much is given, much is required. I I want to give him everything I can. I want to be committed. I want to be sure. I want to be steadfast. I want to diligently pursue the things that God has for me. I want him to answer when I pray. Look at this, Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save. Neither is his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God and your sins have hid His face from you that He will not hear. I, I thought, I thought, I thought, please understand this. We got to stop thinking that we can have this thing our way. It ain't Burger King. It's the King of Kings. We have got to realize and we've got to acknowledge that He's still God and He still sits on the throne and He's still large and in charge. But I have got to lie up with what He wants and what He desires. He will not answer a prayer that's going to keep you out of the will of God. The key, the key... Ladies and gentlemen, is do you carry the authority of the name? Because he said, if you ask anything in my name, I'll give it. I'll do it. Do you carry the authority of the name? One of the great epidemics in our society today, which will in fact, in my estimation, in my opinion will in fact accelerate us to the mark of the beast, which I believe is coming. There are those that are trying to say that that's not true. I saw a video yesterday of a man that bought his groceries by scanning his hand. I saw it yesterday. One of the things that is going to accelerate the coming of the mark of the beast, Brother David, is identity theft is when people operate under a name that's not their own. 
When people will steal someone's identity and charge up great things, uh, great purchases on credit cards or, or to even take out loans. And there have been people destroyed because someone stole their name. Well, let me tell you something. There's one place where that ain't ever happening at. And that's in the house of God. Because it's not my name that's important. It's His name. My name means nothing. I do not pray in my name. I don't cast out devils in my name. I don't do anything in my name. But I do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now understand this. In Acts chapter 19, the Bible says, and we... And we uh, emulate this act. The Bible said that from the body of Paul were taken handkerchiefs and aprons and those that were afflicted by the devils and those that were sick were healed and it's a, as an act of faith. It, it, Paul undoubtedly would pray for, for a, a cloth and it would be taken to a sick person because he couldn't go everywhere. So they, there was a, a group of folks that they saw this taking place. They saw Paul being able to cast out devils and, and pray for people and they would be healed. And so they decided they wanted to do it too. They were seven sons of one Siva, a high priest. And they came on a man who was afflicted by the devils. And they tried to cast him out. Listen to what they said. We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preacheth. That's how they said it. Seven sons of Siva, seven men stand facing one man who is afflicted by the devils. And they said, we adjure you, we order you, we command you in the name of Jesus whom Paul preacheth. And then the devil makes... I always get goosebumps when I read this. The devil that was in him said, Jesus I know. And Paul... I know. But who are you? And the Bible says, let me tell you, I'm fixing to reveal to some of you why you don't ever feel like you win. The reason you don't feel like you win is because you ain't winning. <laughs> Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? Well, we're the ones that jury you by Jesus whom Paul preacheth. The problem was they did not know Jesus for themselves. They had no experience with Jesus for themselves. Listen, that one devil possessed man, he rose up, Brother David. He whipped all seven of those men. He stripped their clothes off of them. And the last anybody saw of them, they're running out of the house naked and wounded like a bunch of sissies. That's in the Bible, Acts chapter 19. You can read it for yourself. You do not get the authority of the name unless you've been born into the family. You do not get to use the authority of the name unless the name has been applied to you. The beginning point for anyone and everyone who desires all that God has for them is repentance. Repentance is the pathway by which you and I will receive what we're lacking in our life, what we're longing for in our life. And ultimately, you will find your way to victory because you fell, because you first found your way to repentance. You want to know why you're not winning? Is you're trying to win with all your toys. you got to let go of your stuff and lift your hands up in the air and declare, I surrender all and I give myself to you. The beginning point of anybody's victory is repentance. I know I've referenced a lot lately. Boy, I feel like i got a little preaching spirit on me this morning. Y'all might have to forgive me. And the way I feel right now, nurses might have to line up and give me CPR here in a minute. <laughs> I'm about to get too old for this. No, I'm not kidding. It's, it ain't got nothing to do with my age. <laughs> it's got to do with what I'm fixing to do after church. <laughs> I spend too much time with my snout in the trough. <laughs> Oh, but I enjoy it though, so you gotta weigh it out what's more important. <laughs> no, I'm just teasing. We have to have an attitude 
an attitude of surrendering everything to the Lord. I had a friend tell me recently about someone else we were talking about. And he said they like the worship and they like what they feel and they like everything about it, but they don't want to change nothing about themselves. An attitude of surrendering everything, including, now please, please don't you misunderstand me. You have to also be willing to surrender who you are in order to become who He wants you to be. Everyone that achieves the victory that you're longing for. Everyone that achieves the place of fulfillment that you're longing for will find it in the same place which is an altar of repentance. We then, when we have allowed our will to be conformed to His will, remember Jesus Himself prayed in the garden. He prayed, Lord, I really don't want to do this. But nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. The key to your happiness, the key to your fulfillment is whether you pray that prayer or not and really mean it. It sounds good. It sounds good for us to be able to pray it. But do you really mean it? And I've told you all before, maybe, maybe when I get like in my 50s or something, the, the Lord will like zap me. But I, I don't have, you know, uh, uh, the gift of prophecy. And, and I, I don't, I, I'm not able to look in your eyes and, and tell what you're thinking yet. I don't know if I ever will. I really don't want to, if you want to know the truth. <laughs> but there are those among us here this morning, not guests, but people that come to church here with a great degree of regularity, that what I'm preaching about this morning, you're still battling with. <laughs> and there's many nights, and there's many times, you want to know why you can't be faithful to the house of God? You haven't fully repented. You haven't surrendered. You want to know why God can't bless you like you want to be blessed? It's because you haven't surrendered to Him. You're still trying to do it your way. You're still trying to have it your way. You're still trying to live for God with everything you've got as much as you can give. But it's not enough. It's not enough. He's only going to settle for everything. Why is the Lord not doing this? Why is the Lord not doing this? The question you need to be asking yourself is why am I not doing this? Now I think, what in the world has this got to do with Father's Day? I'm glad you asked because I'm going to get there in a few minutes. I've had a picture in my mind. Can I just meddle for a few minutes? I'm, I'm glad I got your permission because I was planning on it anyhow. <laughs> Ever since I, I've, maybe since I've been an adult, I, I can't really put my thumb on when it happened, Sister Sharon, but there have been several times in my life that when I'm praying or when I'm meditating or when I'm thinking, Brother Billy, I, 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 I get a picture of a merry-go-round in my mind. It's been going on for several years. And I stood here even here this morning and I lifted my hands up to the Lord and I kind of I kind of was frustrated. Because when I'm preaching under the anointing and when I'm walking in the power of the Holy Ghost, all of the the, the crazy stuff that's going on in my mind is gone. But then it seems like even before I go to bed at the night after I preach, it's coming back in my mind and you're not good enough and, and you know, you, you, you could have done this and you could have done that. And, and I realized, I, I said, Lord, that doesn't come from you. You know why it doesn't come from Him, Brother David? Because He's my Father. One time in my life did my daddy ever tell me I wasn't good enough. But instead, he continually tried to push me to greater heights. He continued to try to tell me, I don't want you to do like I've had to do, and I want you to do greater than 
I've done. I've got to let you know something, saints of God, a person that's struggling, person that's battling things in your life, if you just surrender to the Father, if you just understand that Father really does know best. The Father wants what's best for you. He ain't trying to hurt you. He's not abusive. He's not neglectful. He has no ego. You understand? The Lord has no ego. Brother Justin, it's not about him being able to say, Nanny, 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 you did what I said. Everything, God have mercy. Help me, help, help me, Lord. Receive this. Everything the Lord does in my life is about blessing me. And Brother Billy, sometimes it's chastising me. And sometimes it's taking things away from me so I can be blessed. If you pray according to the will of God, He'll do it. But if you keep praying according to the will of man, it ain't happening. Or if it does, or if it does, you live to regret it. <laughs> Reading the book of Isaiah, the book of Second Kings, I believe it is, when the prophet Isaiah came to Hezekiah and said, "Set your house in order, because you're about to kick the bucket." And Hezekiah turned his face to the wall. Oh, I'm gonna do some teaching on the heavy, heavy teaching on this in the coming weeks but he turned his face to the wall and he started reminding the Lord of all he had done for him he started reminding the Lord of who he had been and before Isaiah got out of the courtyard brother Billy the Holy Ghost told him the Spirit of the Lord told him turn around go back tell him I give him 15 more years the king of Babylon heard that Hezekiah was sick and since Hezekiah was better the king of Babylon showed up to check on him and Hezekiah allowed the king of Babylon into his house and, and saw everything. And the prophet came after the king of Babylon left uh, and said, uh, What in the world did you show him? It's in, it's in the Bible, Ernest. Some of that stuff in the Bible messes with my mind, but it's in the Bible. He said, What did you show him? And Hezekiah said, Everything. I let him come. Oh, man. I let him come in my house. And I showed him all my treasure. I showed him all of my gold. Showed him all my family. I showed him everything. The prophet Isaiah said, and yes sir, good buddy, just coming down the road a little piece, that boy that you just allowed into your house is going to take your children. He's going to take everything you've got. And your sons are going to be his servants. Can I tell you, Hezekiah would have been better off dead. So I'm telling you this morning, under the authority and the leading of the Holy Ghost, it's not only time now, but it is high time that you wake up out of sleep and recognize that that thumping that you've been hearing, that you can't sleep at night, that you don't have any peace, that you can travel and you can go and you can do and you can work and you can make more money and you make a little money and you can have all this stuff and ain't none of it ever worked. Because that thumping you hear is the Lord God knocking at the door of your heart. And he's saying, if you'll just let me in. <laughs> if you'll just let me in. I want to be a father to you. And then he says in verse 15. Of John chapter number 14. If you love me. <laughs> if you love me keep my commandments we show our love for him to him by obeying him period we show our love to him remember Remember David said in the book of Psalms, what shall I render to him? 
for all His benefits. What shall I... God have mercy. What shall I give Him for all He's given me? He gave us the answer in John 14, 15. If you love me, if you love me, keep my commandments. I got a couple of things wandering around in my mind. First off, if you love me, as if we couldn't. As if we couldn't love Him. Everybody loves the Lord. Everybody loves God. But He says, if you love me. Or maybe we don't. Or maybe it's we just don't love Him enough. I asked the Lord this question this morning. I asked the Lord in prayer this question. And I don't, I mean, I, I, we could get into a philosophical discussion like, like we've probably never been a part of. But he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So Brother Billy, our obedience to him is in fact a reaction to our love for him. I love him so much that I want to be pleasing to him. But the question I have to ask myself is, where does that love come from? Where does that love for God come from? Because unfortunately, and I, I, I spoke about it Friday night and, and uh, 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 a little bit, and I've got a book in there, man, it's got a, a thing of statistics this long. But there are presently 11 and a half million mamas Raising children by themselves in the United States of America. 21 and a half million kids in the United States of America are being raised without a father. Twenty one and a half million children are being raised without a father. Now we can talk about, my goodness gracious, we could talk about the extenuating circumstances and, and you know, she won't let me or he won't let me or he don't want to or he's too cheap or, or any, any other number of things. But the problem is, is we've got to recognize it's more than just e each individual's little idiosyncrasy that has caused it to happen, but it, it in fact is a tool of the enemy. Amen. You hear me right now? Because if we have 21 and a half million children raised up who never know the love of a father, how are they going to relate to knowing the love of the Lord? <laughs> you think that's not a trick of the enemy? Oh, buddy, I'm about to, I'm probably going to get in trouble. I'm probably going to get in trouble, but I've been there before. I used to sit, it's nobody in here, so I'm not talking about, but I used to sit at the, I used to sit at the break table at my job. And I would hear these fellas griping and moaning every payday about paying child support. I can't even live. I can't even live. And I so bad wanted to say to him, you sorry rascal. You go home and go to sleep. Try getting up and walking with them through the night when they're sick. Try going out there and defend their honor when somebody spits on them. You ain't got to do nothing but just shell out a few dollars and then let mama take care of everything. You're getting off cheap if you ask me. Come on, y'all. I'm talking about a particular instance. I ain't talking about none of you folks. Unless it applies and if the shoe fits. I heard that. But look what has happened in our world. I, I know people. I know people. 
Did I tell you I know people that it has become a custom, it has become a an accepted part of life that he's going to marry me, but he's going to have three or four more kids outside of our marriage. It has become a norm in society. And it is a trick of the enemy who is trying to come in and try to destroy the role of the father. Let me tell you something, man. You may have extenuating circumstances, but there's not enough devils in hell to stop you from standing up and being the daddy that you need to be. Sometimes it comes later rather than sooner. I've told you all my story. For the first few months of Tripp's life, my wife was pretty much a single mama. Until my daddy got a hold of me. And Sister Maria, I can't put a price on that. So, if you love me, keep my commandments. And I need to always just preach about Peter, James, and John in a sailboat. And then it's safe. You know, I talk about Jonah and the whale. Three Hebrew children. But when I start talking about real life, we get uncomfortable. Why is that? Why is it? I don't know what you're looking for at church, but what you're going to find here is real life. Because we're trying to keep people out of hell. You say, well, what in the world's that got to do with it? I'm showing you. If you love me, keep my commandments. How many kids are in the world right now that do not know what the love of a father is? It's a tragedy. It's a travesty. But I'm about to introduce you to somebody that can make all that go away. I said, I'm about to introduce you to somebody can make all of that go away. I worked for six years at Lighthouse Ranch for boys. 75% of our boys came from church families. Okay? 75% of them came from United Pentecostal church families. And 75% of them also came from broken homes. And they would come to my office, usually after they'd gotten in trouble. And undoubtedly, a great portion of the time, before we got through talking, we would get around to Daddy. And most of them never saw their dad. Several of them didn't even know who their dad was. It was, it was tough. It was tough. But the thing that I told them was that you have the power. You have the power to make sure that that doesn't happen again. <laughs> you have the power to make sure that that doesn't happen again. And without exception, every one of them would say, I'm going to be there for my kids. I'm going to be there for my children. I can't wait to grow up. And, 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 I can't, and, and it, was, it was very, very rewarding when they would tell me, I want to be the kind of daddy that you are. But they had no example. If you love me, keep my commandments. I got to tell you, church, we have a responsibility to reach out into the world. And for those who have not been privileged to know the love of a father, the church has got to introduce them to the father that wants to be everything that they need. And going to teach them and show them what a real father is supposed to be like. <laughs> Y'all making me nervous. <laughs> And I will pray. <laughs> I messed up, Marcus. I usually look out through the crowd and make sure can't nobody whoop me. I'm, I didn't do that this morning. <laughs> uh, 
And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Forever. 